Hi everyone, it's uh, Dr. Goyle here from Peak Human Labs, and today I'm going to be interviewing Hannah Wendt and Varun Dwarka, Dr. Dwarka from True Diagnostic. They're my partners that I refer all my patients to for biologic age testing. And, uh, you know, the big reveal today is that I had my biologic age test done with their new clock called the Omic M age clock. And you're going to be seeing my results, uh, good and bad. It's all going to be shown here today, and we're going to go through it so you can understand where this science is at and how things are changing so quickly. Anyways, we'll talk to you on the other side. Hi, everyone. Dr. Goa from Peak Human Labs. And today I have my good friends at True Diagnostic, uh, Hannah Wendt and, um, and Varun Dwarka. Thank you guys for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us, Dr. Goel. I'm excited to chat. <laughs> Likewise. So, Varun, we chatted, I think, what, a month ago or so when you were, when you were, we ch chatted about the Omic uh, uh, biologic age test that came out. I think just before that, I went ahead and submitted my, my lab results. And, you know, I've been, doing, I've been doing the biologic age test with True Diagnostic now for about three years, maybe one of your earlier clients. Um, and I thought, okay, let's let's do this kind of live with people to see what what it really feels like, and uh, to get one of these results back. And uh, but before we get into it, maybe let's let's just give a little bit of a recap uh, to our audience about uh, biologic age testing. Uh, I don't know if Hannah, you want to maybe talk talk to that because you're doing the whole podcast on everything epigenetics. <laughs> so uh, you know the whole the whole value of epigenetic testing for biologic age, and that, that'd be great. Definitely. And I think this is a really good place to start, right? We know aging is the number one risk factor for every single chronic disease and, and death. So to those listening, you've probably heard the quote before by Peter Drucker, you can't manage what you're not measuring. Thus, we need a way to measure aging, this biological aging phenomenon, right? So we know from the literature, uh, really for uh, about a decade now, which is crazy to say that the epigenetic DNA methylation markers that we're measuring are the best markers to look at when creating a biological age because of you know a lot of factors but um, it's very precise it's extremely accurate sensitive the most important i believe is the most predictive right um, it has to be predictive of clinical outcomes so we can make this applicable and take action mm -hmm. that's where i think you know a lot of um a, a lot of the information can be lost is okay we have a score how can we bring this into the clinic and actually reverse that number one risk factor and mitigate those, you know, disease risk? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been doing this for a few years now with my patients and trying to give them, you know, takeaways from their from their biological age clock. And I was really excited to hear about these, you know, the newer age clocks like Grim Age and, and Dunedin and now the Omic Age. Um, so maybe just just tell us a little bit about uh, maybe for when you want to tell us a little bit about why what makes Dunedin, you know. So far, the best up until the omic age. What made it kind of different and better? Uh, how, how was it measuring something different, uh, differently compared to the first generation, second generation clocks? Uh, and then we can talk about omic age. Absolutely. I think one of the biggest things is to understand the training methods and how um, a lot of these clocks were be, being generated. I think originally when we were able to generate these clocks, we were focusing very much on chronological age as the, as the response to what you train to, and then identifying those CPGs or any kind of features really to that. There's kind of a problem there is because when you're training to chronological age, you still got some sort of understanding of the biological process and biological aging, Yes. but you didn't really maximize the features that were actually associated with the biology, rather they were associated with that chronological age. And so the reason why I started that way is because I think what Dunedin Pace did was actually taking a lot of these longitudinal informations because a lot of the individuals that were part of the Dunedin cohort, they actually were able to measure a lot of their clinical values from the start of the study around the time of birth all the way to the age of 45. So this is about, I think, 1973 uh, till 2000 and I believe 19 or 2020 when the last uh, set of data was collected. Mm -hmm. Now, generating all of that information through a longitudinal study, they were able to collect different types of clinical features, such as their hepatic health, their metabolic health, et cetera, et cetera. And throughout that longitudinal collection, they essentially created a score that was very representative of their internal health, essentially. Mm -hmm. And using that score, they were able to identify 
those CPG sites or epigenetic features that really correlated to that, um, that pace of aging. Now, when you do a lot of these training methods, you're collecting correlative sites that is, are associating with that particular uh, training feature. Mm -hmm. And so if you identify CPGs that are correlating to chronological age, may not be the best you know, if you want to look at biological aging. Mm -hmm. Instead, using the um, uh, pace of aging score, that seemed to be a better, um, better marker to train on. And actually what they showed is that it, it showed a lot of um, association to risk of disease, risk of um, overall mortality, and additional factors which are very helpful in the clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think last, I think we may have talked last time, you felt that this type of aging probably, uh, pace of aging changes every few months. So, I mean, it's, it's something that's in the months kind of rather than days or it's not, you know, it, it has that type of maybe timeline. Is that what makes sense? Absolutely, and, I, and I'll definitely want to hear what Hannah has to say here too because I think a lot of our internal um, um, research really kind of goes into understanding how often these biomarkers change. Even from the biology perspective, a lot of these CPG sites, uh, the methylation mark is actually interchangeable versus just changing your DNA. Hannah, do you have anything you wanted to add there? Yeah, completely agree with that. I think from a clinical implementation standpoint, uh, implementation standpoint that we're seeing the Dunedian pace run a lot more frequently, like you said, Dr. Well, every two to three months. So it's it's just really good. I think it's so precise. It's great at capturing end of one experimentation changes. I, I think everyone who wants to optimize their aging process should be doing it, you know, two to three months regardless and trying, you know, maybe a new supplement or taking something away, right? It doesn't always have to be adding on, on top of something, maybe removing a medication or, you know, trying a new fitness regimen um, without trying to change any other variables, right? Because you want to make sure that that's the true effect. But um, we're starting to see that uptake uh, a lot more. And do you feel that it could, it could show this type of changes? So let's say one went on, I don't know, had a stressful two months traveling or something that could potentially change the pace of aging as well, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I always, I always give this example too. I think this is easy for um, listeners to understand is all three of us on this call right now, we could all take a baseline to Indian pace. Mm -hmm. We could all take, you know, rapamycin mm -hmm. and then we could retake our pace, you know, two months later. I, rapamycin may make me age and make, may make, you know, uverune deaccelerate your aging a little bit. Dr. Well may, you know, change yours in some different way too. So we have these larger populational based studies, but again, these epigenetic DNA methylation changes are so specific to you and you may react differently um, even though we have those, those larger studies. So I think it's a good tool. Mm -hmm. And to that point, that's actually a really good point that you made, Hannah, because um, it really ties into this preliminary data that we have from Stanford, where we've actually been able to see changes within eight weeks in a cohort of individuals that have taken, uh, that have done a vegan diet. Now, the reasons why, that's something <laughs> where we're gonna research a little bit more. What is causing that um, those methylation sites to um, methylate in a way that is younger or uh, de-aging in, in, in a sense? Um, but, but that is where even within eight weeks, we're starting to see methylation changes which are correlating to younger or um, essentially lower pace of aging scores. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, before we get into omic age, I'd like to just dive deeper a little bit into this, this study. Um, so are you saying that it showed up on the Dunedin pace of aging score or the omic age that they show uh, some reversal of aging with the vegan diet? I, in particular, it was the Dunedin pace uh, score because of all of the clocks that we tested, it appeared that um, Dunedin pace was the only one that really showed a significant reduction in that pace of aging, which then goes to show the natural question is why, but what about the Dunedin uh, score is allowing for this uh, level of sensitivity? And what the hypothesis is, is that it's likely because the fact that we were able to capture those hepatic, those metabolic signatures that are highly changing with a diet change, mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's most likely why this um, clock was sensitive enough to pick up those changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's talk about the omic age. Like, so what makes the omic age, you know, uh, different and better than uh, what's come before it? If you wanna, I know this is a bit of a long. Yeah. I'm sure it's a long answer, I'll, but I'll maybe kind of... start just so I can give yeah. like a brief introduction, and then sure. Brune, maybe you can go a little bit more more technical. Um, but a little bit to what Brune hinted on earlier, right? Previously, we've had these first generation clocks, meaning they were trained using chronological age, and those were still really great at the time because they were better predictors of outcomes than your, you know, 
true chronological age your birth date. So um, we move on to this omic M age and we're actually powering it with a lot of underlying biological data, which Marine's gonna tell you about. Um, but this is going to be defined as a second generation clock. So just, you know, think it, it, it makes more sense as we're adding more, um, you, you know, more biomarkers or underlying information, it's gonna become an even better predictor. So the point of this is the omic M age is the most predictive clock out of anyone that's ever been created, even on top of Grim age, except for COPD because Grim age was trained using, um, you know, how much someone has smoked, smoking habits. And I think what I really like, because I'll talk a little bit more on the clinical side, Dr. Guell, is that this gives you reasons as to why you may be aging. So biological age mm -hmm. testing is really cool. You get this yeah, number back, you're maybe right. a little older, you're maybe a little younger, and then yeah. you give epidemiological trends or associations and recommendations. But now we can actually look at 36 clinical lab values, metabolites and proteins, and tell you, oh, this looks a little bit off. Maybe you want to target mm -hmm. um, the cardiovascular system and work on, um, I don't know, blood pressure, yeah, right? Yeah, um, yeah. From more of a clinical standpoint. Yeah, let's, I, I think we're going to get it. I'd like that we go through some of the clinical markers on my report, just because I think it'll be useful for people to understand, like, you know, what's what's generally most predictive of, of, uh, of aging and what's not. So I think that that'll be useful. Um, uh, anything else before we get it, get into that? Do, should we move right into that into that aspect? You want? Uh, I, I do want to maybe um, explain why the name was changed. Yes. That was uh, sure. chosen the way it is, uh, because I understand that uh, one of the questions I, I received was, "Why did you name it that?" <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think that, that the name actually is very telling of the of the methodology that we chose, mm -hmm. because omic is essentially under, uh, looking at the data sets that look at all t types of layers of biology. Mm -hmm. And so when we say multi-omic, what we're looking at is epigenomics, so your epigenetics, proteomics, your protein levels, metabolomics, your metabolite levels, and then also phenomics, which is your clinical data values. Mm -hmm. And just by that name alone, it's I think it should be apparent that we're taking all of these into a single composite score, but really the the, what's really cool is the the individual scores that really compose the composite omic. Mm -hmm. And omic M is essentially methylation. So again, we're in, imputing a lot of these just from the methylation itself. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes um, as a, in the future, what we hope is that clinicians and physicians or anyone taking a lot of these uh, blood data, you know, maybe the composite score isn't necessarily what's important. It'll start to be those individual EBPs or epigenetic um, um, bioproxies, essentially. Um, and so that's that's actually something I really wanted to highlight because, and we'll go through this in the future, we might be expanding these EBPs. And hint, hint, I think we have. <laughs> wow. So, um, okay. Yeah, look out for some updates. But I wanted to just mention the nomenclature because I think that also explains the methodology really well. We didn't um, necessarily, I, I, I didn't listen to the podcast yet, but you talk about, I know, I think uh, Hannah was a, on methylation risk profiles. Yeah. So this idea yeah. that you could pretty much predict, uh, you know, disease risk, which sounds like you're, exactly in effect, right. I can see that's coming with the omic kind of age that you're going to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah. So true to, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, yeah, the Harvard group, true diagnostic, they coined this EBP term, right? Because the MRS. What I just talked to um, Dr. Mike Thompson about on my podcast, mm -hmm. those are risk scores. So those are actually definitively drawn back to risk. So we didn't want to call ours risk because they're not risk, they're biomarker proxy. So the way I like to look at it, um, and I just came up with this yesterday <laughs> uh, as I was talking to a healthcare provider, is think of the input. The input is DNA methylation epigenetics. Mm -hmm. That's all we're taking. Mm -hmm. And the output is going to be another biomarker, but not a biomarker we use in the input hence proxy, right? Um, so it's another way to interpret something else through the lens of DNA methylation. Mm -hmm. From a technical aspect, we've, we've definitely benchmarked these because uh, a natural question we get is how, um, you know, how similar are these to the actual values? Why is it that you're doing a methylation? Um, and what we see is that on average, our, our correlations A are greater than uh, 0 0.6 um, and really, almost 0 0.8 for a lot of these um, underlying values. But I think this also goes to the aspect of why um, there's error even in predicting chronological age is because you're picking up a biological signal using just methylation that you can't be finding, uh, you can't find in um, the proteins itself because it goes back to the central dogma 
where there's a lot of predictive power in the upstream epigenetic signals, which then following do central dogma give uh, back to the protein levels. Is there any concern that, because the cohort was, a, I think, a Harvard group, I don't know, for over the last 60 years or something like that, uh, that there's certain, um, is a, how can we ap make it applicable to uh, different people from different ethnic backgrounds, or is, this, is there some, or, you know, today's age, modern world, is, uh, is there some concern about that? I think that, I think that there is. Um, and, but then one of, the, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, so we spent a lot of time in the initial, I think almost six months, just identifying these samples. And the reason why we wanted to identify these samples is that we wanted to maximize the number of uh, the, the disease representation, but then also um, it, it make sure that we have equal parts of disease representation and normal representation that way. Obviously, you know, we are getting this from the Mass General Brigham's biobank, so there are, you know, uh, demographics that are overrepresented in this biobank. But what we've also been able to see is the, is the overall similarity in acro across the demographics as well and the underlying biology. Now, what we've also been able to do is identify uh, statistical methods to translate some of the findings from the Harvard uh, cohort so that omic MH can actually be used in other additional cohorts as well. So this includes scaling, um, adjusting for means, um, maybe even doing some type of nonlinear transformation where essentially now you're not only just um, looking at apples to this weird amalgamation of apples and oranges, but really apples to apples comparisons. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of it under the hood where we've been able to translate a lot of what we've been identifying here to um, the true diagnostic cohort or even any other cohort. But I think the methodology is is unique, and now that we've been able to identify the methodology, we can start bringing in other data pieces into it so that it becomes more ubiquitous across populations. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, um, the clock would benefit at all from further training, like uh, like tying it back again to more clinical data and testing oh, it? Yeah, I think I, I think that this is where the EBPs are going to come into real play because right now we've only been able to, we it's not only we really uh, for this V one specialized on the ones that really um, were important um, mm -hmm. in the um, in the first generation of this clock building, and so I think it was about a maybe 396 that were really um, looked at. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, as of today, we, we finished modeling about um, 4,000 EBPs. That includes um, additional metabolites and proteins. And we have an additional 1,000 that hopefully by the next week we'll be able to finish. And so all of these are going to be additional covariates that are going to be sent in. Um, on top of that, out of the 61 that we got from uh, Mass General Brigham, um, 11 were chosen uh, for this initial build. Mm -hmm. Again, for proof of concept, really. And mm -hmm. so moving forward, you know, we're going to include additional EBPs and then also, you know, working with clin uh, with uh, clinicians, practitioners, uh, such as yourself, you know, we'd we'll be able to get additional data sets so that we can build EBPs. So um, I think it's going to be a group effort, but we're willing to help <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, perfect. Uh, are we time for the big reveal or what? Like, uh, should we pull up uh, one of my reports so we can show people? <laughs> what it yeah, looks like. Absolutely. Should I screen share? Yeah, screen share. And then maybe let's just, I know you have a number, you have like, what, 10 different reports now. Uh, yeah. So I think we should tell people, yeah, these are all the various, various reports and, and what they do. And, um, and then we can kind of deep down and deep dive in a couple of them. This okay. is the quote unquote healthcare provider summary report. Mm -hmm. So um, you'll first see that we have our new OMIC MH here. Right, um, so I, I can definitely hop in um, if, if you'd like, and then maybe Varun, I'll, I'll have you explain some of those uh, risk factors and, and just how we uh, calculate that relative risk. So first and foremost, um, you can see that Dr. Goyle has taken this test um, quite a number of times. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you may have just even registered another one. Yeah, I did, because well, so. I was just like, I got to beat the score. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I great was curious, to uh, you know, I be wanna... able to, uh, yeah, obviously see these these changes and, and understand maybe what may be driving some of those changes too. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, we see uh, his biological age just a little bit above that calendar age or chronological sure. age, right? Um, so that um, this needs 
this isn't your fit age, this is your OMIC M age, uh, mm-hmm. is higher than your calendar age by about 1.41 years. Mm-hmm. Um, hence this 53.76 right here. All right, now it's, it's flawed thinking in terms of, oh, my biological age is higher than my calendar age, that's bad, or it's mm-hmm. lower, that's good. Mm-hmm. To quote unquote, again, normalize this for lack of a better word, um, we need to compare you to a population, right? Um, and that's where this percentile comes into play. So we do see you, Dr. Guell, in the 82nd percentile, basically meaning um, you know you have uh, higher aging compared to a lot of people of your same chronological age. Mm-hmm. So even though you're just ever so slightly accelerated, this means that people of your same chronological age actually have you know way younger biological ages. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, and pause there. Um, maybe if you want to expand on the percentile, and then we can uh, score down to the risk. I do have a question. Just even was like it's just intuitively, I would think that uh, people who are fifty two years old and have biological age of exactly the same, wouldn't that put them in the fiftieth percentile, or that's not doesn't work like that? Not necessarily. Could be. The... Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah. So if the um, if let's say everyone in our population did have uh, the same amount, uh, the same omic age, sure, um, you, your percentile would be based on the rest of the population. However, we are comparing this to a population of about 20,000 individuals. And when we looked through, um, before we actually established this kind of methodology, we ensured that there wasn't an over-representation of a single omic M age, that the, that the distribution of the data was actually fitting a normal distribution, if you will. And so with that said, um, the the chances that everyone is going to have the same exact um, by, uh, omic MH is actually very low and thus does fit a normal distribution, which allows for this type of percentile calculation to, to relatively work. Mm-hmm. And it's also a, the, the chances of everyone in the 20,000 having the same exact omic MH is uh, it's, uh, it's unlikely uh, there as well. So we were we chose to go this method because of those reasons. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I was just, I just trying. Right. I was just it trying to think all that depends on the population. Yeah, and I'm just thinking that it looks like the population is actually has a younger biologic age than what, than their chronologic age. It sounds like we have a very relatively healthy cohort, mm-hmm. if you want to call it. Correct. Right, because I, I think that's one one of the things that going back to your question of you know representation. I think that once we start to incorporate different types of um, um, cohorts or uh, data sets from different uh, representations. Um, these percentiles will change because it's going to start representing d- diverse health um, demographics, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so right now we're comparing you to, uh, I would like to say, and Hannah, I, I think is a better person to ask, the best of the best. So um, we're making it a little bit harder from the percentile perspective. Yeah, it's hard for me to win that one. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> but uh, I just... Um, the uh, this complete segue, but the rejuvenate Reju- rejuvenation Olympics is using the Dunedin one, right? Are you they plan to use this Omic age for their uh, for their uh, contest? I'm I, I'm not sure yet, Brun. I don't know if you have any info there. Um, I think you're more involved. I I don't know. Um, but I don't think we've completely kind of done a hand wave over the idea. I think we we would be interested, possibly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the reasons why Dunedin Pace was chosen was because of the literature that supported it. Mm-hmm. And because Omic MH is just out, one of the things we would like to do before we start using this in something like Rejuvenation Olympics is to actually test it out. So using different types of data sets that are established, um, maybe even looking within our own clinical trials and seeing if you know how Omic MH is actually uh, changing um, mm-hmm. with some of these treatments that we know actually works. So Hannah mentioned rap- rapamycin. That would be awesome to do some kind of a study where we get to see how um, omic M age is actually changing with rapamycin. Yeah, or, or looking, I know you know the, the study, Dr. Guo, the, the calorie randomized control trial, right, where the Dunedin pace decreases, um, but a lot of the, you know, the first generation clocks don't, and the second generation clocks look okay. Um, it'd be great to see, you know, how omic M changes. So again, like Varun echoing what he said, going through and, you know, rerunning um, the omic M age on a lot of those interventional clinical trials. Perfect. Okay, let's keep going. So what's after this? So here is the relative risk score. Um, So we can actually report out risk of, you know, death, cancer, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, COPD, and depression. And I'll have uh, Varun expand on this, but basically, um, correct me if I'm wrong, the reason we're able to report these out is 
again, what Bruin was edging on earlier, meaning we hand selected every single person from the biobank, from the 5,000 people, right? So we're able to pick these specific diseases because we had these outcomes or these relationships um, all alongside. So remember, we're, we're tracking these people all across their life. We know when they were healthy. We know when they ended up getting some type of disease here, which is why we can report it back to the relative risk. Mm-hmm. Yep, makes sense. And this, and this was really the reason why it took forever to select is because, uh, again, we wanted to maximize the sample size while also maximizing the, the risks or the diseases that we were representing. Um, and kind of going into the statistics here, um, because the Mass General Biobank was very well annotated, um, we were able to look at the, the approximate date that the individual passed away, if um, that information, if that individual did pass away, and then use a Cox proportional hazard model, which then built the model for assessing risk. And so a lot of the information here is that actually taking that same model that was developed in the Mass General Brigham's cohort and then bringing it back to the true diagnostic cohort. One of the things I will admit that you might be thinking is, again, why are, how are you taking a model from a different cohort and putting it in here? And actually what we've been able to do is make those statistical adjustments, be able to look at the means and the, and the standard deviations and scale them accordingly so that we're not over-representing that percentage. And so um, I, I have to give a shout out to Natalia uh, Carreras-Gayo, who is another um, bioinformatician with us. And she, she was very much, um, her, her and I were very much involved in ensuring that the um, adjustments were made accordingly. This is a relative risk. Just so for the and this is the relative risk. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And we get that question a lot. You know, um, what about absolute risk? Meaning if you walk out the door and get mm-hmm. hit by a car, um, I don't know if you can ever predict or have an absolute risk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because that's like being kind of the definition of absolute. So mm-hmm. um, it's all relative. And again, the positive takeaway here mm-hmm. is that it's changeable. What I really like is there's a little hint of gamification here. Yeah, I saw that minus that, one year and plus yeah, one year. Yeah, right, right. if you lower this by one year, mm-hmm. you lower your risk. Got it. Right? Yeah. And that's the point of this is driving patients to make better decisions. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe thinking twice about um, performing something that may be hurtful or, you know, uh, have a negative impact on their health. And, you know, mm-hmm. the opposite is true. If you increase it um, by a year right here, you also will end up increasing your risk too. So remember mm-hmm. this relative risk is because of the omic age being a little bit higher in mm-hmm. the percentile here. Um, thus we see a little bit influx um, in the increased risk area. Uh, you know, I might, if, if you don't yeah. mind, it's yeah. not represented here on your report, but we have seen um, like hundreds, uh, like the percentages reaching 100 and even negatives. Wow. And I do want to specify that this is statistically possible. However, you're not, if you're over 100, it doesn't mean that you're currently passed away or dead. <laughs> it really means that your risk is so high that it is, uh, quite, it is, it's very, very high, essentially, based on the statistical model. So if, if you're in that realm, don't worry. We're not saying, you know, get your affairs in order. It's just more of, you know, maybe take it a little bit more seriously and try to figure out ways that you could reduce it. So maybe let's just discuss the elephant in the room as someone's looking at this and they're saying, hey, uh, you know, Dr. Goyle did five tests before that, and they're all kind of relatively the same, but then what happened, hey, in the last year and a half, it kind of, I think, aged to almost five years uh, in a year and a half. Uh, so what, what, what could you see that could cause that? Like just, you know, is this just um, all things being equal? Like if, you know, where do you, how do you see this type of thing happening? And, or, or could, there be some, could there be some other factors that are, you know, not, uh, that could lead to some type of, you know, inaccuracies? Definitely. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll go first on that. So I'm just going back yeah. and seeing when you collected the sample. Um, so it looks like you collected the sample um, on June 1st of this year. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure what happened in between that, that time, Dr. Well, from just like a, a lifestyle. You know, uh, actually, I think what happens that the, the June one got lost because I think this is where we resubmitted it. I think, so you could see here report. Is it possible that it was uh, submitted? Uh, oh, that's very interesting. Because I only I think I only recently submitted because we it got lost in the mail. <laughs> Sorry, I know people are just. Gosh, gotcha, so this. you submitted it more recently. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the, you didn't re-register it, but your original collection. Didn't yeah, yeah. She just resent it. So I think it was actually done in in September. Okay. Well, I know we were chatting before we got online here. Um, that something might- I'm particularly interested because I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted from traveling all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is 
you know, you'll, you'll see a lot now on social media about even um, like toxicity, um, even yeah. on a plane, right? Yeah. Um, and your stress levels, your inflammation shooting up. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know for me, at least when I'm traveling, I'm out of my routine. I'm definitely not eating as healthy. I'm definitely not hitting the gym as hard. I'm not sleeping as well either. My, you know, whoop definitely tracks that and, and is, is mad and upset at me. So lifestyle factors, it's pretty intuitive, right? Think of all of those basics. Um, kind of those those you know downward effects um, that we may get from you know even even just a, a, a little mishap or, or traveling. I know you're very active, uh, Doctor Goel, right? You're still playing soccer and yeah, yeah. and, and things that. like that. Yeah, moving the body. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear from you. I guess if there's any, you know, this is where it gets really hard. Is we need to do a really great job of, of tracking things. That's why I'm kind of a fan of Brian Johnson because everything's public and he tracks it very well, so you can pinpoint to certain things. But um, you know, I know that's, that's very hard to do. Um, and he has the, he definitely has the resources. Mm-hmm. So if there's maybe something from a supplement medication or procedural based therapy mm-hmm. that you really changed here that may mm-hmm. have caused that increase. I want to say one more thing though. Yeah. It's important to keep in mind, you know, the last time you took the test was over a year ago. So we got to count that chronological year yeah. in there, but we still see a slight acceleration. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, just, um, yeah, apart from the traveling, which was, you know, a difficult uh, summer. I think I did this test in September or so, because, uh, mm-hmm. well, but we can go back and have a look at it. That, that might change the results as well. Uh, I was just curious. I was just thinking that, and, and how movable is this so people don't get despondent? Uh, how changeable do you see these type of results? Well, so within uh, what we recommend typically is about six months um, for the standard test. And I mean, with Dunin Pace, for example, we're seeing changes within eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things with Omic Age that we're going to do is actually look at individual populations and see where those changes are occurring. We can kind of estimate that based on just even your second test to third test here. Mm-hmm. Um, so if we identify that time span, which really goes from the second to third, and then even the third to fourth, um, those kind of micro uh, tests can actually estimate a relative change um, that one could expect across our entire population. So I imagine the six months to even about three months is what is enough to actually make that that level of change. Um, just ba- just basically looking at your uh, your own data right there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Especially that uh, 49 to 48. Um, I'm actually curious what you did during that early 2022 because whatever that was, it seemed to drop it, you know, cause you were, it seemed like you were heading in kind of a upward trend and then you completely re, um, got back to essentially where you were on the second test. Yeah. Uh, there was a bit of COVID, it's, COVID's confusing a lot of things around here. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I did get a COVID infection. I had some type of Lyme infection, uh, but I have been doing, you know, a number of plasma freezes treatments. Um, mm-hmm. Probably did some more in, around that time. So it's yeah, it's a little bit um, uh, interesting. At, at you know, if we look at the Dunedin Pace uh, aging one, I don't know if you ha- you keep it on this report. Oh, you do have it here, and you can see that yeah, that's generally been pretty good, apart from one blip that was um, yeah. above one. And, yeah, I think it's important. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll say I think it's important to note too. Why does this metric look different than this one, or this sure. goes up and this goes down, right? Yeah. And on, honestly, I, I agree, right? It's it's confusing. It can be a headache at sometimes, but we can't get lost in the details. We also we can get lost in the details, but we have to think big picture, which is yeah. very plainly, aging is extremely multifactorial. It is extremely difficult, and we're starting to understand it more. But what we believe at True Diagnostic is that you need to measure all of these different outcomes and look yeah. at them synergistically to then make a plan and move forward and see those changes. I will tell you, mm-hmm. the omic M age does follow the clinical picture more. So with all of the other algorithms, when you compare to and Pace to, you know, intrinsic, extrinsic, telomere length, omic M age, omic M age and and Pace have the highest correlation mm-hmm. out of any of them. Right. So they should follow suit the most. But again, if you think of how these were created and you think of, the populations they're looking at, they were created to produce different outcomes. A pace of aging versus a firm kind of biological age, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I just wanted to play the ear with that as well. Yeah. You know, and going from what uh, Hannah was mentioning, I think uh, we really did um, take inspiration from uh, GrimAge because I think that GrimAge, while it looked at about nine, um, nine different markers, 
the the idea there was an interesting idea, but we knew that nine markers is not, not enough to capture the entire thing, the gamut of uh, processes that are changing. And so that's why we added the additional 100, uh, over 100 markers based off of the multiomics, uh, the 398 that were tested for. Mm -hmm. um, and so really I'm seconding what Hannah said there because it's, I think it puts in more information than what, what typically is there in previous clocks mm -hmm. or even age predictors really. Sounds good. Uh, let's go, let's talk a little bit about the immune system. I know you have, uh, you do uh, do a kind of subset analysis on immune health, and maybe just to kind of explain a little bit to, I, I mean, I had some difficulty understanding it. <laughs> yeah. And so I think yeah. this, this part would be helpful to our, to our viewers to understand the importance of immunosenescence and, and what's happening with aging. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and start first, and then turn it over to you. So this one was published, um, again, thanks to Barun, our great bioinformatics team, um, and Genome Med with Harvard, Johns Hopkins, and Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, we have this new 12 cell immune deconvolution method that can basically, uh, it, it's up to par with the, the gold standard being flow cytometry. So, I mean, I think the lowest R correlation value is 0.97 um, within the, the representations here. So that, that paper is, is absolutely amazing. Um, again, what does this mean clinically? I'm always gonna relate it back to the clinic because you, you can't translate some of this. We're not immunologists, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. What we learned from that paper that Bruno will touch on though are lifestyle factors that are correlated with different immune cell outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, so we know obviously that smoking is really bad for us and can increase or decrease certain cell counts that aren't too great for us. Um, but the overall goal and, and kind of what I just attended uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland's um, conference as well, uh, Preventative Lifestyle Medicine Institute, it was about the immune system is we want our immune system to function properly when we have foreign invaders, and then we just want it to really, um, you know, be healthy when it's not fighting foreign invaders. So still thinking of a big picture, but now starting to draw some of these correlations and connections. So clinically speaking, we still focus on the CD4, CD8 T cell uh, ratio. And I can pull up this paper right here in Genome Medicine mm -hmm. um, that you can see. So again, true diagnostic using these published validated algorithms. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I can show you that R correlation value photo because it's beautiful um, mm -hmm. and then maybe Rune, you can add more insight <laughs> no i thank you for bringing this up because i think uh, one of the things about this paper is that actually individuals with the help of their uh, physician can actually look through and make a lot of those choices mm -hmm. yeah and you can see those are correlation values here so comparing again dna methylation epigenetic percentage of those free floating cells in the blood with the actual true result that you're getting from flow cytometry um so these Correlations, again, are unheard of in science. You traditionally don't see, you know, really strong correlations, again, with the weakest probably being 0.97, which, you know, is still considered excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So really, panel, uh, panel B is kind of showing a lot of that. And um, as uh, Hannah said, we tested this against back sorting, so flow cytometry, but also single cell RNA sequencing. So uh, there are a lot of single cell RNA sequencing data that's available. And so what it does is look at gene expression, and then you can actually pick out individual um, uh, cell types based on their gene expression, like their cell markers and things like that. And we tested among the, those two. Again, this is based off of just methylation. You give us a methylation data set, we can impute a lot of this information. And so where this ties in is learning a lot more of that immuno health, but also this was one of the inputs into uh, yeah, omic age, really going back to the whole aspect that this is not only, it, it's a composite of various aspects that we know affects health. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so, th so these, these, these um, immune subsets were also included into the omic age, is that omic age? During the training process. Oh, I will okay. say mm -hmm. none of them actually stayed on during the feature selection, oh. which means that they were removed based on the algorithm. And the main reason why is because the, we also included some clinical variants of the methylation. Mm -hmm. And so the algorithm actually chose the clinical variants than Over the these uh, methylation variants. Not saying that the methylation variants are wrong, it's just more that the, you know, you have to make a decision between um, either or. And so it actually chose those and then pushed these out, but they, they were included during the training process. Got it. So generally you'd like to see a lower uh, CD4, CD8 ratio, is that correct? Because it, it increases. Actually, the I, Sorry. There's, there's something in that paper, um, uh, Hannah, if you go back to the paper and go to figure six. Or oh, sorry, higher. 
Yeah, because um, one of the things in this paper that it really helps in figure six, there are these um, hazard ratios that um, mm. what we what was really, really awesome. And again, because we used the Brigham's Biobank, we were able to select for a lot of these diseases is to show the relationship between each of these individual cell types mm -hmm. to the uh, individual diseases. So all cause mortality, stroke and type two diabetes. Um, I, for individuals that are watching that really want to understand how this is even read is anything on the right side of the line means you're at higher risk for that particular cell type, which is denoted in the Y in the Y axis. So in, um, in type two diabetes, where Hannah's pointing the neutrophils, the increase in neutrophils actually increase the overall risk for type two diabetes. Whereas the memory B cells, um, at the bottom and the basophils and the CD14 naive cells um, increases in that lowered the risk of type 2 diabetes. And yeah. anything that is cold, uh, and also CD18 naive and natural killer cells as well. And so anything that is colored essentially uh, means that it was a significant change and anything that's grayed out, it has showed no significant changes there. And so if individuals are curious as to, you know, how do we put this into a clinical context, you can take what you have from the report and then maybe cross-reference it to this figure and then start to understand, oh, okay, so, you know, my, um, let's say CD14 naive are very, uh, very, very high. Um, it, it, what we typically see is that higher CD14 naives are actually lower in cardiovascular disease. So that's kind of a good, good um, aspect because obviously the, um, the overall um, hazard ratio was below the line. And so that way, we can actually start to piece things together. And this is something that we'll be working on for the next version of the report, but it, it, at least there's something here that we can start to um, look at in terms of the individual uh, cell types and their association to um, risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Your uh, CD4 to CD8 T cell ratio though looks good. Dr. Guile, so you wouldn't be between one and four. Um, you're at 3.32. Again, why this one? What's the focus? Um, just in terms of clinical relevancy, it's the one that's most related to, you know, um, altered immune function, immunosenescence, chronic inflammation, uh, where you could be immunosuppressed if you're too low or have a little bit of hyperreactivity if you're above the four area. So this looks good. So generally, as you, it gets lower as you get older. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Starts decline. Yeah. So the mean is 2.5 for my age. Is that correct? Is that what that means? Uh, just from the confidence uh, interval range. Oh, okay, okay, okay. The mark, Be between okay. one and four. Oh, yeah, okay, got it. Got it. Yep. I'm going to a couple other uh, immunosenescent ratios as well, but again, harder, I would say, to relate back to the clinic. Mm. Um, you know, neutrophil lymphocyte, more of a, what we call the stressometer here, got right? It. So um, between one and three being normal. Dr. Guell, you're at 3.24. This looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the optimal cutoff value will very depending on the patient, population, disease state, et cetera. Um, but that's a good interpretation there. Okay. Keep, yep. I got it. Telomere length. Yeah. So we understand. understand yep. So that. the telomere length, you know, not a huge fan of it from a clinical aspect, um, just because it has a low predictive power. So just what Varun was saying, hey, these immune cell subsets are really predictive of, you know, disease outcome and hazard ratio. Telomere would be the opposite, meaning, you know, telomere length being the biomarker and diseases being the outcome, they're just, it has a really low hazard ratio. It's not very predictive. So we like to take this with a grain of salt, um, but it is still what I like to call like a senescent cell check-in. So I usually put the cutoff around the 20th percentile, meaning if you have a patient or someone's in the 20th percentile or lower, mm. you have more senescent cells compared to people of that same chronological age. Mm -hmm. So we would wanna give you senolytic therapy, clear some of those senescent cells out, which would have shorter telomeres, and then you artificially increase that average telomere length. So kind of like getting rid of the worst five people on the basketball team and you know the free throw <laughs> average goes up but eh, that's kind of all that happens you know what's yep. interesting uh, you know is that i find almost everybody is at um, increased risk at least for the obesity ones i think we're going to show after almost every so we remove that one oh okay <laughs> that's because of that <laughs> okay um and you know we can talk offline later but most people were showing an increased risk mm -hmm. um so we think it was due to some maybe populational based issues that we're yeah. trying to correct for maybe everybody's obese yeah, has that in north america yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah you have you know no increased risk for obesity um 
these are new markers, right? These are an infl uh, inflammation markers, so the DNA methylation CRP and IL-6. So um, mm -hmm. the really cool thing about these, again, EBPs, is these are more precise than traditional CRP and IL-6, which is mind-blowing to me that this isn't standard point of care. So these markers are more like a three-month running average, almost like an HbA1c level of CRP mm -hmm. and IL-6, because mm -hmm. we know if we get nonspecific serum CRP, it can be affected by exercise stress, you know, if you drink caffeine before you get tested, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where it's just kind of a point in time, this is more of that three month running average here. So is this, uh, when, you know, the blood test done, we normally do a high sensitivity CRP. Is this similar? Uh, it yeah, would so, be, yeah, go ahead, Brood. Oh, no, no problem. Yeah, I, what, we actually, when we looked at the, um, the values to train on, we did use HS CRP. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mean, in, in uh, Canadian units, uh, you know, it's usually like zero. Most people are between zero and three. So I'm wondering if the units are different. I suspect. Oh yeah, we we can uh, double check there because we have one version that is HS CRP, but then we also created another one for just the regular. Um, uh, I think the there's I forget what the unit is for the other version of the CRP, mm -hmm. um, but. We were able to create for both, um, and I believe the HSCRP is also one that is included in the uh, full Omega image. How are you, how are you seeing uh, um, the results on the mitotic clock? Like, how um, uh, is it bringing any ex extra insight? Yeah, I would say, you know, if uh, th this kind of completes the picture um, in terms maybe of a correlation uh, to cancer risk, right? Not causation. So mm -hmm. these people up here mm -hmm. are in like the 99 point, like nine, seven percentile or higher. Definitely mm -hmm. have early signs or detection of cancer where we say, okay, if you're in maybe the 90th, 95th percentile or higher, mm -hmm. you have a history of cancer, you're above 50, you probably want to do some stage zero liquid biopsy cancer screening, right? right. So this acts as a good almost like kind of prerequisite maybe to the grail. It's the grail. a little unsure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Be interesting to see, yeah, what uh, people who have positive grail tests, what, what does it show up on this test? Really yeah. interesting. Yeah. All right. One of, the, one of the things, too, is that, you know, a lot of these markers can also, um, I like that Hannah used the word correlation because what we also see is that sometimes it can be associated to um, different types of behavioral habits, so such as um, drinking and also, and or, um, smoking habits as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's a lot of, because ultimately the CPG sites that were selected for here encompass a lot of the, the cancer related, you know, cell cycle, um, essentially cell cycle uh, uh, conversion and things like that. And so that process can actually exist in multiple different types of biological processes. And so while it does a very good correlation to, um, cancer we also see it uh, increase with other behavioral aspects as well okay perfect let's actually move down to clinical markers because I, I want to make sure we run out of time here uh, I think those were the kind of interesting ones here which ones do you want to look at uh, weight loss response uh, drinking, the um, some of the clinical ones the um, the clinical uh, oh, the, yeah, the, la the lab yeah the lab value okay. just just to say what people can know yeah. what, what are looks to be important uh, from your analysis uh, which showed up as really important, I think. Yeah, so I think, well, let's go ahead and just use the clinical lab value factors because yeah, uh, yeah. it's the easiest to understand um, mm -hmm. and maybe for the context of, of this call. So, Varun, if you want to explain this graph and then we can go into some of the individual ones, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, so um, in whenever we developed this model, we actually looked at it just kind of like your Y equals MX plus B. So you have weights associated with each of these different, um, here it does say MRS, but it's actually EBP, uh, epigenetic bioproxies. And so what this allows you to see is what is the, um, what is, I guess, the culprit or the driving force for a lot of the aspects of the clinical factors that is contributing to your omic MH. And so um, the direction in which it's going means that as omic age increases, it has a positive effect in that increase in omic age. So those types of scores, you would like to hopefully have that as low as possible. And so what this is, is the, is the weight multiplied by your score. And so typically if the weight is higher, you will show a higher um, weight regardless. And so- um, What is this red? The what is the side, red? You see, what is, the, what is the red? What is that one? That's obviously causing a huge 
increase in, mm -hmm. the, in the score. What is that? Yeah, it's red cell width, RDW. Oh, RDW. So that could be, that's very interesting. So RDW would be seen in sometimes increases in, so increased RDW is, is a risk factor? For, I mean, as a marker for uh, increased biological Correct. issues? Yeah, and, and to summarize that too, you know, usually we see the same trend. It's not always the same with proteins and metabolites, which makes those a little bit more difficult, but interesting and fun. So we typically see red blood cell width, HbA1c, and fasting glucose being those three that are, you know, pretty high here. If you don't see that, you probably want to take a little bit of a deeper dive, but it's this image is awesome. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, shout out to our graphic designer, because what you notice is the body systems contributing to the development of omic age through, you know, again, these omic lens are mostly red and pink, right? So having to do with the cardiovascular system and the inflammatory system, think mm. blood glucose, think mm -hmm. insulin, think, mm -hmm. you know, um, blood pressure, again, all these in inflammatory based markers. So again, keeping big picture, this image is really good to hold on to. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, so why do you think the RDW has such an impact? Do you have any, any do we have any... I don't know, side to seven understanding of why would it have impact? I mean, that's, A one C makes A one C is very obvious, and you know some of these are make complete sense. Um, I will show you yeah, my well, spreadsheet. <laughs> Go ahead, Bruno. <Rune. laughs> oh no, uh, actually, the spreadsheet would be uh, one, one place to definitely look at because um, a lot, again, a lot of these were pulled out from the algorithm itself, and so. We um, spent a little bit of time trying to go through and trying to explain. Yeah, this is just giving the definition. But again, I think um, we're starting to get... Got it. Starting to point in the right direction, right? Yeah. Um, but maybe the reason as to why or how um, is definitely when we would start to look more um, at uh, the mechanisms or, or the pathways, right? So I'm trying to pull up even this uh, epigenetic biomarker proxy PowerPoint I can share with you yeah, afterwards yeah. too. I don't know if you have this. Yeah, yeah, I've um, seen this one, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, it does a great job at, at kind of going through, um, of course we see hemoglobin here. You can see the red blood cell with. Um, so basically if an illness has resulted in greater fluctuation in RB, RDW, so that's, I mean, it looks like why that Correct. happens in the... And again, maybe it has something to do with, yeah, hemoglobin, right? So obviously mm -hmm. the red blood cells are containing hemoglobin. Um, so we can kind of put both of those together and even look at, you know, the hemoglobin. We actually want this higher, um, mm -hmm. right? And on you, Dr. Guell, it looks like you're in the ninth percentile. So you're a little bit lower here. Yeah. Even that... though hemoglobin isn't going to be weighted as much, you know, we may recommend, I don't know, iron supplementation, foods uh -huh, that contain yeah. a little bit more iron. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. I'm, like on the, I'm on the lower side for some time and uh you know when i was on the, taking a little bit of uh testosterone replacement therapy my hemoglobin increased in the past so i don't think i was on that recently or something maybe maybe that's the issue yeah yeah mm -hmm. um but you can see where and i said i repeat this every single time i talk about this report you can see how the devil is in the details right, right. where mm -hmm. you can really pick apart every single one of these um so so these again are the the lab values where we say okay we maybe want to take a you know better look at fasting glucose, HbA1c, red blood cell width. Um, I think maybe for just, even, oh, go ahead, Bruin. Even albumin, actually. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things about albumin is that it was lower, um, it was it was lower than anticipated, where actually an increased albumin um, is more akin to a younger chronological age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, I think, you know, for the viewers, what's interesting here is that uh, like you said earlier, is that we now have, we can provide some reasons, because the issue was that we could never provide any reasons why anybody's age was what it was. I could just tell them, look, this is what your, <laughs> that's what the test came back, improve your lifestyle and, you know, just do the best you can, and let's test it again, you, you know, but I think this is a big jump ahead, because here we're predicting various factors, and we can say, look, your hemoglobin A1C is the reason why you're, you're, you're getting your particular age, and we can work on that, and we should hopefully see changes if their A1C actually improves, we should see changes in the, in the omic MH. I'm hoping, like, Correct. you know, yeah. uh, I mean, it should it should be there. I'm just, uh, what 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 is that? What is that uh, relationship value? You said it was like 0.8 or something. What is it between the A? Let's say an A1C, uh, the true A1C and, and the testing data and um, yeah. and the prediction. Like how close yeah, is it? Yeah, so our um, the, the 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 highest one that we had was um, I think it was um, FEV. Yeah. Um, and FEV was a, about zero point seven nine. Okay. 
correlation. Yeah. Which means that at least the slope uh, of the line. So essentially what it means is that um, the directionality and the magnitude that it changed is equivalent. So even if the units are not exactly the same, mm -hmm. it changes in accordance uh, between uh, between each of the time points. And therefore, um, the slope is exact is very much the same, 80% similarity with the slope. Yeah, so, I think that's important mm -hmm. because a lot of people get, you know, hung up on on the numbers right yes like all 6.42 h2o and c what the heck yeah or you know fasting glucose and i wouldn't get maybe too hung up on the actual outcomes as i would the percentile right like focusing mm -hmm. where you are in relationship to the population um and again seeing how you can affect that percentile from change but of course this is the interpretation the ebp from dna methylation input hba one c output yeah, I think the absolute number may not matter as much as you're saying the percentile and how you compare to other people. Mm -hmm. uh, your age, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yep. All right. So then, uh, and then, uh, you know, we probably won't go too much deep depth, but beyond that, you look at all the proteinomics as well, mm -hmm. which is a huge, <laughs> this is a huge thing to kind of go through because some of these we don't really understand or we're not able to yeah. know how we can affect the change yet right now on some of these. But but one of the things is that because um, we were able to develop something like this, mm -hmm. um, again, it goes back to Hannah's point, just really looking at the trends. Because if you see a positive slope, just know that your dot needs to be lower than everyone else in order to make a positive impact on your omic age. If it's a downward slope, you want it to be as high as possible because what that higher number represents is a younger age because younger individuals have a higher number associated. And also, in addition, these are scaled values because, again, proteomics and metabolomics are inherently a different number system. Essentially, they're a different distribution than uh, methylation. So really driving home to the point uh, where Hannah's mentioning that percentile is going to be very helpful. And even the graph, just simply looking at the graph, it will give you more uh, information of where you exist and what could happen if you, let's say, increase your, that, that dot higher or lower. Um, in relation to just the chronological age itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I think that the only issue is here, like let's say bone morphogenic protein one, we don't really know mm -hmm. how to change that yet, right? Like, sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the only concern I have. But, but, um, but I think it's, a, it's interesting. I think it's going to come. Now that you've highlighted these, people are going to start thinking about how can, they, how, yeah. can we, how can we change some of these things? Like that's now my next piece to figure out, okay, <laughs> I'll tell why you are these are things? Some you'll find nothing on, which is very interesting. You're like, does this even exist? Is this a real protein? Is this a real metabolite? Yeah. Um, and the answer is yes, it does. Um, mm -hmm. It just hasn't been maybe, you know, studied as much. So yeah, I think the the, the end goal here is, is, okay, hey, a lot of this is correlation association. Quite possibly we're getting to some causation here, yeah. right? Yeah. As to maybe why we are exactly aging, which I think is, is really yeah. exciting. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we appreciate any and all feedback on the reporting. Uh, we would honestly always this will always be ever changing um we could have spent you know years rolling this out in terms of the perfect way to to you know plot it or put it on a graph in terms of interpretation um but we just wanted to get it out there um yeah. and we'll keep updating this as we make no, improvements such a big help uh are you thinking about showing the historical va uh value you know range of each one of these because again it'd be difficult for someone to go back and look at the previous reports and see how are they been doing because, yeah, okay, I'm at, you know, 9.16% higher, but was I 20% higher before? And, you know, that's, that's where I've, the, the changes happened. Because, again, people are concerned about the change um, yeah. and how yeah. they compared to before. That, that would be more useful because instead of having to go back to each report and plot it out myself, that would, you probably could do that much easier than me. Definitively. Yeah, we, we definitely need to do the historical um, kind of data and processing. I know we had it there at the top, yeah, for just the omic age, but we need it for the singular ones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then we also need it um, for these as well, how your weight changes over time. Yeah. Maybe not all time, um, because that would be very difficult to visualize, but at yeah. least um, maybe the last two or so. Yeah, I think this is, this is great. This yeah. is this is I hope one of the first ones you you're getting to do out there right on right live like this, which I want people to understand is that is real stuff happening. Science is moving very quickly. What was I think you know nobody could have thought you know ten years ago is like reality now, 
Uh, and I think within another five years, we'll have so much more advances. Hi, I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Hannah Wendt and Dr. Dwarka. If you liked it, please uh, subscribe to our channel. Visit us at peakhuman.ca and join our membership program uh, called Peak Rewards. And uh, like and subscribe uh, as well as comment. So I look forward to your feedback and we'll talk to you soon.